Welcome everyone to the Resilient Nation Partnership Network's virtual forum series. I can't believe today, October 28th, marks the final day of our month long series exploring Alliances for Equity, hosted in partnership with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. My name is Bradley Dean and I am the Communications and Partnership Specialist with FEMA's Risk Management Directorate. It feels like it was just yesterday that we were kicking things off with our keynote speaker, Dr. Atia Martin who spoke about the prejudices within the field of resilience. The following week, we sat down with public and private sector leaders to talk about how we're cultivating a path toward equity through chair commitments and financial investments. And last week, we discussed planning efforts to operationalize equity into resilience. Throughout the series, our team has captured your questions and comments and will continue to do so today. We look forward to coordinating with our speakers and the broader network to develop collaborative resources that we can all use on our individual journeys towards building a more equitable future. We encourage you to leave your questions and comments in the live chat box to the right of the video. You can also anonymously leave comments in the comment thread towards the bottom of the screen. Please keep your comments and questions prof professional and inclusive. Today, we are focusing on building a foundation for action by featuring perspectives from state and local leaders who will provide insight on their journeys towards building a more equitable future. We are incredibly honored to feature our opening speaker today, Wisconsin's 45th Lieutenant Governor, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes. He is the first African American to serve in this position in the state and the second African American to ever hold statewide office. In 2012, at the age of 25, Lieutenant Governor Barnes was elected to the Wisconsin State Assembly where he served two terms. His tenure in the state assembly included serving as the chair of the legislature's black and Latino caucus. In his current role, he serves as the chair of the governor's task force on climate change and uses a platform of sustainability and equity to fight for solutions that invest in opportunities and fairness for every child, person and family in Wisconsin. Additionally, he collaborates with the Pew Charitable Trust Flood Prepared Communities Project on advancing statewide resilience planning efforts. Thank you to the Pew Charitable Trust for helping us welcome Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes. Lieutenant Governor Barnes, the floor is yours. Yep, <laughs> happens every time. <laughs> um, I just wanna say thank you so much for having me. Uh, really excited to be here to talk about number of things that are impacting uh, my state specifically, but the nation as a whole. Uh, I want to especially thank the Resilient Nation Partnership Network for hosting the Alliances for Equity event series. And this particular event on state level action around climate change and making sure that we are all working and do everything that we can do to build equitable and resilient systems. Uh, in my time as Lieutenant Governor, I've had the privilege of traveling all over the state. We got to all 72 counties in our first year. I am really grateful that we got to all 72 counties the first year because we tried to do that again this year and were immediately paused around uh, March. So having the opportunity to get to do that uh, in the first 12 months in office was certainly an experience that I'll never forget. Uh, but a lot of those visits came with uh, seeing some devastating impacts of climate change. Uh, we've uh, Many of those tours or trips uh, became storm damage tours. We've seen extreme weather events, uh, including but not limited to flooding. And we see farmers and people in rural communities uh, whose livelihoods are at risk constantly. Uh, we see a lot of these hundred year storms occur much more frequently, um, be it every other year or sometimes every year. Uh, historic levels of flooding impact, uh, impacting communities and neighborhoods all across Wisconsin. And we're seeing people whose communities are also being polluted, but they don't have a way to relocate their families to places that are uh, much more healthy for them uh, due to lack of resources or due to investment of time over years. Uh, but the issues that were neglected and made worse, we as, a, uh, as an incoming administration made a commitment to first acknowledge climate change as the issue uh, that it actually is and recognize the impacts, but also recognize the opportunity for us to fix things and create opportunity for people all across Wisconsin. Uh, prior to us coming into office in January of 2019, the words climate change were struck from our state agency websites. People were prohibited from speaking objectively about it as an issue and 
we saw scientists routinely purge and force into early retirement as well because they weren't able to do the work uh, that they committed their entire life, lives to. We saw uh, deregulation, just helping polluters, not people. And this is a regular occurrence uh, in our state. But like I said, we are proud to take Wisconsin in a much new direction. Uh, we can go on and on about the things that went wrong, but it's important for us to look at those mistakes and chart our path to the future. And that's all we've been committed since day one to embrace the science and to make our state a leader in tackling the climate crisis. On election night, uh, when I took the stage, the first words out of my mouth were, was, we're bringing science back. And I'm proud that we're doing just that. And that starts by started, I should say, by joining the U.S. Climate Alliance. And we vowed to uphold the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. If not, go even further, uh, because there's so much opportunity and room for us to grow as a state. Now, Governor Evers signed Executive Order Number 38, which created the Office of Sustainability and Clean Energy. And the goal was set up ensuring that all electricity consumed in our state is 100% carbon free by 2050. Uh, I am of the mindset that we can uh, we can be a little bit bolder and we can push this beyond 2050. We can do this much sooner. I think that the moment calls for us to move to to complete this work sooner uh, and not 30 years. But I think we should be working and cut that time in half. And Governor Evers also created the task force on climate change. And I am so honored to have been named chair of this task force. We've worked to bring together people from all parts of our state. And we've worked to identify meaningful climate solutions with equity in mind, um, because this is the only route for our state to be able to thrive and prosper as it should be able to. And we started by making sure that the task force is made up of a diverse group of people representing Native nations, representing agriculture groups, labor unions, utilities, the youth climate movement, et cetera. The list goes on and on and on. And we've also been very intentional about making sure that there's been geographic diversity in the people that the task force is engaging with, whether it's rural farmers or urban ag groups, because this crisis impacts every community. And that is the message we want to get across to everyone. We hope that by bringing more people to the table, that we'll be able to craft policies uh, that lay the foundation for this work right here in Wisconsin and begin to address the many areas impacted by the climate crisis and also to position Wisconsin as a leader so that we can be an example for other places. Uh, for all the years that we've lagged behind, that gives us an opportunity uh, to show how much ground you can make up if you really put our, if we really put our minds to it. And throughout this work, we've made sure to keep environmental justice at the forefront of our conversations because for far too long, our lower income communities, communities of color all across Wisconsin have experienced the worst impacts of this crisis despite playing the smallest role in causing it. And these environmental injustices contribute to the severe racial inequities and in health and well-being that plague Wisconsin. And people have been trying to address these inequities for years now, uh, for generations, if we're being honest. But what a lot of people don't always realize is that it's not always due to individual actions or personal failings. There are systemic factors that cause black and brown communities, for example, uh, people living in, growing up in less clean environments where there are so many health hazards that are exposed to children, especially. There are neighborhoods with highways built right through them and communities are polluted as a result, resulting in higher rates of respiratory illnesses. There are factories that have contaminated water and land with PFAS and other chemical contamination. And, you know, these factories, they, you know, they knew what was going on even back then, but a lot of it was overshadowed with the promise of jobs. And a lot of people did get jobs, but unfortunately on the other side of that coin, people had their health irreparably damaged. And we've also seen overtly racist policies like redlining or the forcing of indigenous people on the reservations to box them in areas with the fewest resources and minimal investment. We can't continue to do this because our nation is at a turning point in which we can craft a society that works for everybody where decisions aren't made at the expense of our most vulnerable, uh, but instead the most vulnerable have a seat at the table and crafting the policies that would impact positively their way of life and quality of life. And in order for us to move towards that future, we have to be inclusive. We have to incorporate equity into all of our decision-making. That's what we've made sure to uh, center environmental justice every step of the way with our task force. We've been very intentional, again, about including low-income communities, communities of color, especially our indigenous communities in this work so that we can solve the problems effectively. And we engaged all of our members in discussions about systemic racism and environmental justice, regardless of who they were or what their background was. 
And many times we found people just didn't understand what was going on. They just had no idea, no clue about the disparities that existed in health outcomes uh, due to environmental factors. So uh, I've been approached uh, by members of the task force that uh, expressed how grateful they were that they were able to take part in these conversations. And many of these people have been doing this work for decades, but never had those conversations about equity and how it implies or how it applies to uh, environmental issues. And so the more we can have those conversations, I think the more effective we'll be, uh, not just with the task force, but as a state and also as a nation. And this kind of work hasn't been done at the state level here in Wisconsin. And we know that it's well overdue. And I'm proud that we made it a priority, but we still have so far to go to continue the path to achieving environmental justice and making sure that we turn these much needed policy discussions into reality. And as the task force worked to craft the recommendations, we knew that building resilient systems had to be a key focus. And as I've mentioned before, the impacts of climate change on the weather and water systems cannot be more apparent in our state. We're seeing more hot and muggy weather in the summer along with extreme weather events and flooding that continues to wreak havoc on our buildings and our public infrastructure. For example, in March of this year, Flood events in Ashland, Wisconsin caused over 7 million gallons of sewage to flow into Lake Superior, which is the source of Ashland's drinking water. And on the topic of Lake Superior, we know that Lake Superior is warming up much quicker than the rest of the Great Lakes. Now, that is, um, it should be a cause for alarm that any of the Great Lakes are warming at the rate that they are, but especially the fact that Lake Superior, the largest of the Great Lakes, is warming up quicker than any other. And Ashland was also subjected to a 500, a 500 year storm event, not one of the 100 year ones that I was talking about, but a 500 year storm event in 2012 and 2016 and a 1000 year storm event in 2018. So nearby the Bad River Ojibwe community saw devastating impacts from these floods. We're talking about events that should happen or should not happen like over, we're talking 15 lifetimes, but we see this in a span of six years. And in February of this year, I had a chance to visit Monroe County in Western Wisconsin and I had a chance to survey some of the damaged infrastructure and the breached dams that were still broken from a 2018 flood event. And as our climate keeps changing, we're only gonna have more extreme weather events and more flooding. So we have to start working to invest in adaptation strategies and infrastructure so that we can better endure the impacts of flooding and storms and we can build more resilient communities while we do the work to stymie climate change. And we need better stormwater management strategies. And I would say that we need more up-to-date stormwater strategies given uh, the frequency of events that we're dealing with and experiencing. And we also have to restore some natural methods and water management like wetlands. And we have to protect our wetlands much more uh, than had been done uh, prior to us coming into office. And uh, I am also very concerned about uh, the current White House's plans for wetlands and how they view them. And we shouldn't look at them as development opportunities. We need to look at them as mitigation opportunities, as necessary parts of our ecosystem, necessary parts of our society. And when these extreme weather events and natural disasters happen, we know that lower income communities have the hardest time recovering. They are more likely to live near hazardous waste sites. And those sites will leak contaminants into the air and they will also leak contaminants into the water when they are hit by climate related disasters. And they are also left behind when more affluent people are able to move out of environmentally sustainable, unsustainable areas. And so that's why we have to invest in building systems that can withstand these disasters and support those who are most impacted by them. This includes providing local municipalities, all local governments, city, county, town, village, with the resources that they need to build infrastructure that can withstand uh, the brunt of the environmental catastrophes that we are experiencing. And so we have our work cut out. Uh, if you've listened to anything I said, you can take one piece out of it and know that we have our work cut out. But if you listen to it all, we know that we certainly have work to do, but I am absolutely excited and I'm proud uh, that we are acknowledging these issues and more proud that we are uh, laying the groundwork for Wisconsin to be a climate leader. And we always need to remember 
why we are doing this work. And it's not to feel good uh, about ourselves or it's not about being on the right side of history. This is about making sure that we are fighting for our lives, the lives of our children and the children to come. And the people we don't even know, the people we have yet to meet who are going through some very severe hardships, not knowing uh, what is next for them, quite frankly, or what the next year will bring. And so if we wanna build a state where people's lives and their livelihoods aren't threatened by every storm, we need to do the work to continue to move towards a more equitable, a more sustainable, uh, and a more resilient way of life, if not for ourselves, for, for the people who have the most to lose or the least to lose in some instances. Uh, but that little bit is sometimes everything for some people. And if they lose that little bit, who knows what's next for them. So I just wanna thank you all for being here. I wanna thank you all for your commitment. I wanna, especially wanna thank you all for incorporating equity into this work because we have to make sure that we aren't leaving people behind as we come up with the solutions to combat climate change and uh, create more resilient communities. So thank you, Lieutenant Governor Barnes. Uh, we really, really appreciate you joining us today. Um, I'm now excited to uh, begin our next discussion on state resilience, uh, featuring Amanda Martin, Deputy Chief Resilience Officer of North Carolina, and Brian Ambrett, Senior Climate Resilience Coordinator at Maine's Governor's Office of Policy Innovation in the Future. This, conver this discussion will be moderated by Laura Lightbody, Director of the Flood Prepared Communities uh, Project at Pew Charitable Trusts. Laura's work directing the Flood Prepare Communities Project is aimed at reducing the impact of flood-related disasters on taxpayers, communities, and the environment by reforming federal and state flood and disaster policies. Laura, I'll now turn it over to you. She's not in the meeting. There she is. Laura, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, great. Um, well, thanks everyone. Um, thanks Brad um, for hosting this over the past month. It's been a really rich conversation. Um, I actually think Lieutenant Governor Barnes made my job really easy um, because he actually set up the sort of state of the problem really well that is not, unfortunately, not unique to Wisconsin. Um, I think he mentioned there's 72 counties that uh, he was able to travel to over the past year. And, um, you know, our research at Pew shows us that, um, you know, where it rains, it, it can flood. Um, and that when you look back over the past decade, all 50 states have been impacted by major natural disasters. So I think he, he hit the nail on the head there really well. And what we've seen is to, to meet this threat, um, a real sort of emerging trend among um, governors and states trying to be proactive, governors and legislatures mandating statewide resiliency planning efforts as a way to get ahead of uh, the impacts uh, but also to coordinate resources, more strategically deploy funds um, across the state. Um, just in the past five years, past five years, we've seen at least nine states put in place mandates, uh, both Maine uh, and North Carolina included, um, and Wisconsin in the works. And so hopefully we'll be able to say um, those numbers are ticking up slowly um, over the next year. And, and I will say this includes both red and blue states. Um, when we talk about natural disasters, we tend to focus on flooding, but flooding knows no jurisdictional boundaries. It doesn't care about politics um, and it doesn't care about state lines. And so all, all 50 states are, are impacted by this, um, red or blue. And um, what we're seeing is that as part of this mandate, um, these state level positions are being created, which is really important to um, put folks in charge who are tasked with um, planning and executing these, these efforts to adapt to the increasing impacts posed by 
more common, but also more costly natural disasters. Um, if you look, you know, since 2000, natural disasters have cost the United States over $850 billion. So the number, the numbers are insurmountable and continue to increase. Um, but I'm excited to be joined by two of these folks um, who are focused on this from the state level, both Brian and Amanda, Brian from Maine, Amanda from North Carolina, to talk about what their state is doing to prepare for these increasing threats, um, but also um, how they're integrating e equity into resilience planning, but also into implementation. I'm just going to read a couple headlines that I think really um, illustrate the challenges and complexity of equity issues as it relates to resiliency. Um, these are just taken from news headlines. Rich counties get more help to escape climate risks. Flooding disproportionately harms black neighborhoods. Gaps in data hinder equitable disaster recovery. Disaster loans entrench disparities in black communities. So um, these are complex issues. Um, that certainly doesn't capture, capture it all. Um, but I, I think the words are pretty clear there and, and help illustrate um, some of the challenges that we're hopefully going to tackle today. My work at Pew has really allowed me to work closely with folks like Brian and Amanda um, and others across the U.S. who are tasked with these planning efforts. And what we have heard and what we know for certain is that they're, these folks are tasked, faced with many challenges. Um, all of which we won't get into today. We certainly don't have the time, um, but equity really is a common challenge across all efforts in all states. So I'm glad that we can have a concerted, concerted, dedicated conversation about it um, over the next 40 minutes or so. So I wanna just start the conversation to help set the stage by hearing from directly from Brian and Amanda. Um, Brian, you can, we'll go to you first, um, just really, Tell us sort of at the high level about um, what you're tasked with doing by the state. And can you touch on just two main highlights of those sort of planning efforts? Because I know there's a lot involved and they're very detailed, but for folks to really walk away with, what are sort of the two main highlights there? Thanks, Laura. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here with you all this afternoon. Um, two really important topics, resilience and equity. Um, when Governor Janet Mills came into office two years ago, she made tackling climate change a real priority of her administration um, and joined the US Climate Alliance right off the bat to commit to the Paris Accord agreements and targets. Um, and then she created my office, the Governor's Office of Policy Innovation in the Future and tasked it with a number of her main priorities, one of which was climate change. Um, and in the next legislative session, um, bipartisan bill came through that created the Maine Climate Council and set really ambitious targets for greenhouse gas reductions, uh, reducing emissions 45% by 2030, 80% by 2050, and ensuring the resilience of Maine's people, economy, uh, and communities. And so the, my office is really tasked with supporting the Maine Climate Council in its work to draft a plan that gets us to all of those targets. Uh, the plan is due in very short order on December 1st. Um, and uh, we're working on ways on pathways to get to the greenhouse gas reduction targets and on ways to support uh, communities, uh, the economy, different um, natural resource economies across the state in becoming more resilient to the impacts of climate change. And throughout all of that, um, really bringing an equity mindset to the work that we're doing. Um, so we worked closely uh, over the summer with the University of Maine, the Mitchell Center, uh, for sustainability solutions to put together an equity framework that can be applied to all of the proposals that the Climate Council is considering. Um, and that framework really gives us um, the structure that we need to address the systemic inequalities um, with the systematic process. And so we've got some um, really key guiding questions to make sure um, that equity is being incorporated, that we're considering not only how the policies uh, and proposals that are coming through the council are affecting the health, the wealth, uh, and the well being of the people uh, across Maine, but how different types of vulnerable populations will be impacted, or hopefully how their lives may be improved by the work of the council. 
and really making sure that uh, their participation in the process is meaningful. We had a um, stakeholder uh, advisory committee that was really focused on equity as well and making sure that the assessment and the framework were grounded uh, in the experiences that um, people in our communities are having on the ground. Um, and so uh, happy to talk more about the details as we go throughout the conversation of this today, but um, really a uh, great start to this work. Um, and the plan that's due on December 1st is really just the beginning. It's the implementation of all of this, making sure that equity gets carried through how all of these proposals and policies are carried out will be key. And um, Amanda, this that was a good sort of segue into where North Carolina is because North Carolina is really sort of on the other side of things in that implementation stage. But Amanda's been there from the beginning. So tell us a little bit about what's going on with your work. Thanks, Laura. So the North Carolina story about resilience comes from a lot of different places. And I think one of the most important pieces of groundwork for what we're doing now is that we've had multiple federally declared disasters, flooding disasters specifically in the past four years. And so um, we've also benefited from a resilience champion in Governor Cooper like Maine. We've um, been very fortunate to have that type of leadership. Um, and when Governor Cooper came into office, he was very determined to make resilience part of our recovery. Um, and so there've been a few um, pieces that have gotten us to where we are now. Uh, the governor uh, issued executive order 80, which is North Carolina's commitment to uh, coping with climate change. Um, it's largely focused on clean energy, but it had an important component which called for the state to develop a climate risk assessment and resilience plan. And that process wrapped up. We issued our plan in June and it's available online. And it was the result of a tremendous amount of uh, participation from state agencies, from uh, scientists who volunteered time to help produce a state specific climate report um, to federal support, federal experts who lent their support to our process. Um, so at this point, we are now that we have issued the plan, we're starting to look at implementing it. Um, and one piece that's happened at the same time as we were developing this plan um, is that the governor established the office of the chief resilience officer. Um, and our chief resilience officer is Dr. Jessica Whitehead, and uh, she has a three person office. It's uh, Dr. Whitehead, myself and another colleague. And um, in addition to pushing forward the state's agenda on resilience, we also are staffed to our state disaster recovery task force, which in North Carolina advises the state government on disaster recovery. And so we've been leaning on several subcommittees of that task force to advise on disaster recovery and specifically a resilient disaster recovery and resilience moving into the future. And so that's been a really important component of getting input from stakeholders. It's a mix of uh, state agencies as well as organizations outside of government that have a particular interest in environmental preservation, in housing, um, in serving disaster survivors, for example. Um, and with respect to equity, we had, as we put together our climate risk assessment and resilience plan, we wanted to have a chapter on climate justice and that chapter, it actually came to be called our uh, chapter on environmental and climate justice. And we had input on that chapter from a standing advisory board, which is our environmental justice and equity advisory board, actually advises our Department of Environmental Quality, which I should have started and backed up. I, I said our office sits in our Department of Public Safety. Um, and so with the input of that advisory board, we crafted this chapter that looked at a few elements of equity and justice as it relates to resilience. We, um, we looked at socially vulnerable populations and um, took the time to explain that concept and looked at why populations have uh, face inequalities or unequal access to resources due to past or current discrimination or um, holding insurance or not holding insurance, the kinds of um, political capital that they may hold. We also looked at unequal exposure to climate hazards. So um, which parts of our state 
especially with flooding, uh, flood more often and why in particular in our inland floodplains, we see a lot of communities of color and poorer communities that are located in uh, highly vulnerable areas. And so trying to highlight some of those issues um, as well as issues with extreme heat, um, wildfire, we have, you know, flooding is perhaps most at the forefront of everyone's mind in North Carolina, but we have other climate hazards that we need to worry about as well. Um, and then the last piece that we looked at sort of systematically is inequalities in the implementation of climate adaptation and resilience policy. Um, and these come from a few different perspectives. A lot of our um, policies that we use to make individual property owners more resilient are focused on the property owner, um, especially in owner-occupied housing. And so that can often leave out renters. Um, and it can leave out property owners who are less able to individually navigate the system by which they get assistance in whatever way. Um, but we also see that resilience policy is favoring, we see it emerging in our larger urban areas. And we have a number of urban counties and local governments and councils of government in North Carolina that have taken a leadership role with addressing resilience, which is fantastic. Um, and at the same time, we see that our more rural populations, our poorer areas, areas with less population, areas with less economic activity, are not able to advance resilience goals in the same way. Um, for lack of bandwidth, for lack of resources. And so um, we see this as a, a, an inequality that's pervasive across the resilience world. So one thing that we're doing as we implement our resilience plan is we establish the Resilient Communities Program, which is a program that sets out to provide technical assistance, coaching, planning, support, leadership training in rural areas to help rural regions identify their resilience priorities, kind of come together to understand where they are at with their vulnerabilities um, and collectively identify those projects that the region would like to pursue. And it might be, might be infrastructure projects or it might be programming or education or policy um, just to help tee up those regions to start implementing what their own self-identified priorities are for resilience. Um, and this is a component of equity because we see such a big disparity between what's going on with respect to resilience in our urban areas and what's going on in our rural areas. And, um, and they're, very, they're very interconnected, um, particularly when it comes to flooding. We know that um, all the development in our urban areas is flowing downstream to our more rural areas. So um, it really needs to be more of a statewide conversation. Um, so that's a little bit about where North Carolina is at with respect to resilience planning and a little bit of what we've been um, talking about and working on with respect to equity and resilience. Thanks, Amanda. You both touched on um, the, the process of sort of engaging stakeholders, getting feedback um, that is often done traditionally through community meetings and public hearings and town halls. Um, obviously, COVID has complicated that um, and equity sort of exacerbates, you know, the problems of it, equity are exacerbated. Um, access to technology and broadband um, is one of those examples. Um, Brian, can you talk a little bit, how have you adjusted your, how have you had to adjust your strategy um, to really make sure as the Lieutenant Governor hit on that every voice is heard through this process, particularly um, those who are sort of less represented and, and um, don't always have a seat at the table. Yeah, when um, we were about four months into the planning process uh, with the Maine Climate Council when COVID-19 struck Maine um, and we had to take the entire process uh, virtual and um, you know, the, the council has a, is 39 members, but with the working groups, it grows up to 250 members very quickly. And all of those meetings were open to the public. So we had to figure out how to conduct the business of those working groups and the council in an online space, how to make it still available to the public um, to observe and participate, um, and then figure out how we were gonna do the public outreach that was so necessary. Um, through a virtual space. And so um, it was a big learning process for sure. Um, 
And, uh, and we were working with the Consensus Building Institute, which is a facilitation firm based out of Boston. Um, and they've been fantastic in giving us a lot of strategies um, that really um, helped us bring um, a high quality process online. Um, and I think, um, you know, taking it online actually made it more accessible to a lot of people in the state of Maine. Um, if you don't have to drive two or three hours to get to Augusta to, to sit down and sit down on a meeting, that makes it more, more accessible. Um, but there are 80,000 plus households in Maine that don't have access to broadband. Um, and so um, we've tried to figure out how to um, be accessible to them too. And when we were doing the public outreach, um, we created materials that could be downloaded and printed and um, taken into your home, your kitchen, your dining room, um, and worked through um, with your family members or a couple of close friends, and then um, submit comments back to us either through email or um, regular post mail. Um, and so um, it wasn't perfect. Um, it was a lot of things done on the fly, but um, you know, we made an effort to um, make sure that folks had multiple ways of providing input on the process um, but I think in the long run, we'll find that we had um, more participation um, by virtue of being virtual. Um, and that showed up in some of the, in, in the results of the public outreach that we did this summer. We got over 4,400 responses to a survey from across the state covering 75% of the zip codes in Maine. So um, I think we were fairly successful in that work and it's, um, it's gonna be ongoing. We have more work to do. We're, we're gonna be virtual for quite a while longer here, I think in Maine. Um, and so we continue to learn. We've all been forced to become a little more technologically advanced, I would say. Um, Amanda, anything you want to add to that? I think you're on, I think you're on mute. Thanks. Um, I would add that also in North Carolina, we are seeing that, um, despite many barriers, there are some aspects of engagement that are being made possible by, Zoom technology. Um, and I'll give an example. Our, our Commission on Volunteerism had been tasked after, I think with COVID, um, we've had so many disasters in the state, um, with a feeding operation. So um, providing meals. And they were turning to us and to our partners and saying, um, we don't hear about any need from our Latino communities. So we're not sending any food there. And that doesn't seem, something about that doesn't seem right. Um, and what happened was that with some facilitation support from the Commission on Volunteerism and some partners of statewide organizations, they were able to establish a coalition of uh, more grassroots organizations that serve Latino communities that could channel some communication to state government. And um, so bringing together like 13 or 15 community serving organizations in one place on Zoom turned out to be way easier than doing that um, in a particular place. We have a big state. Um, and so, and a number of people have commented to me, I don't think this would have been possible if we weren't all forced to use Zoom. So there have been some advantages. Um, and, and with respect to stakeholder engagement broadly, and I think I can say this because at this particular second, we aren't working on active stakeholder engagement. I just really emphasize spend money on it, budget for it. Stakeholder engagement is really hard. It's messy. And um, I think there can be a tendency to think that uh, we all just know how to do it. But the truth is that stakeholders are we need to treat stakeholders like the experts that they are. We need to treat them um, in the same way that we treat our scientists. Scientists are offering us um, extremely important information for our resilience planning and policy. We need to make sure that we approach getting information from stakeholders and working with stakeholders to craft policies with that same level of importance. And so um, I will echo what Brian said about um, hiring a, a firm that does community engagement and that centers equity in their practice um, and will be delivered, deliberate about designing a process that meets your particular objectives for um, communication, for input, for co-designing a process, whatever that looks like. Um, I highly recommend budget for, budget for doing good stakeholder engagement. It takes time and it takes money. So um, you didn't say this exactly, but um, I imagine that I'm hearing that one of the challenges that both of you are up against is budget and funding. Um, 
And what I was gonna ask you is what are some of the biggest challenges you're up against? Um, but I know that money uh, is always one of the biggest challenges here. Um, do you wanna kind of flesh that out a little bit um, as you talk about challenges that you're faced with now and, and even looking into the new year too? Sure, yeah, um, it's, it's certainly a challenge. Um, state budgets have been decimated uh, by COVID-19. Um, and so we're definitely feeling the crunch. Um, we're still in the planning process. So it's, um, it's really impacting the conversations that we're able to have about implementation. Um, so it hasn't really hit um, this work yet, but it's coming for us very shortly as, as the planning heads to the legislature and the governor's office um, in the coming months. Um, I think one of the other challenges we're up against, and, and Amanda was just talking about this um, around communication, um, you know, it's, it's a real challenge, particularly in this environment, to communicate what we mean when we talk about becoming resilient and how it impacts people's lives. Um, and people everywhere are just dealing with the immediate crisis of COVID-19, whether it, we're talking about with towns or with businesses or people in general. Um, it's, it's, it's tempting to put climate and, and resilience to storms on the back burner um, because the COVID crisis is just front and center for everybody's mind um, and it's taking up all of the bandwidth. Um, but I think, um, you know, it, a lot of the things that we talk about when we talk about building resilience to floods or to storms is the capacity building and the network building um, and all of that will help with um, the response to this uh, COVID-19 crisis and, and other types of crises that maybe we can't envision yet that are coming down the pike. Um, and so I, I really think that communications is probably the biggest challenge that we have and, and one where it's really important to spend the time and the effort, as Amanda said, um, to really communicate what we talk about when, when we mean resilience um, and how uh, how it pays off in people's lives and in the well-being of our communities. Um, you know, and if, if you think about, you know, somebody in Maine who has a long rural road to drive down to get to their grocery store or their doctor's office, um, you know, that kind of stuff is really important to them. Um, but if there's a culvert that washes out because of a flood and it means they have to take a 10 mile or a 30 mile detour to get to that same place, well, now we can have a conversation about, COVID-19, their doctor's office, their grocery store and resilience all in one, uh, in one shot. And so, um, but getting to that level of understanding about what matters to people and what matters to community is, is a real time and effort investment. It's worth it, um, but you do have to plan for it. I would add that kind of like Brian, I think that COVID has highlighted aspects of resilience that are actually just as critical to natural hazards and climate resilience, but aren't always at the forefront. So um, when we talk about accessing healthcare or uh, our systems that support finding people housing when they have to leave their housing, um, those are all, those are, that's something that is impacted by COVID. It's something that's impacted by natural disaster. Um, and there are lots of work, worker safety, perfect example. Um, we're talking about worker safety with respect to pandemic and COVID, but we also talk about worker safety with respect to uh, higher heat and outdoor workers in North Carolina. Um, and so I think that uh, while we haven't seen next year's budget and we are anticipating budgetary challenges, of course, um, but we're trying to find those opportunities in the conversations that are happening with respect to COVID. Um, and one, one other piece I would say is that um, finding opportunities for equity in um, the big chunks of federal money that are coming our way, either they come our way every year or they come because we have a disaster. Um, is another way to do resilience work inside of a limited state fiscal picture. So looking at where resilience can go into obviously our disaster recovery spending, um, looking at the role of equity in um, BRIC and in the way that we, um, we find and develop BRIC projects, uh, looking at uh, resilience and equity in our 
in our uh, COVID dollars. I mean, a lot, you'd be surprised, a lot of the, actually our agency, I work in the Office of Recovery and Resiliency, and we've been spending HUD money on disaster recovery for two years. And down the pike comes all of this money for COVID recovery. Well, the governor asked our office to take that money because there's so many similarities in the kinds of issues at the end of the day, the kinds of issues, especially that vulnerable communities face during disaster um, and during COVID are there just are so many similarities in, in, in the kinds of issues that we need to solve. So uh, I think there are opportunities even within uh, shrinking budgets and state budgets. And you bring up the, the federal government and, you know, the sort of track record that the federal government, but really um, governments have historically in addressing this issue, which is mostly reactionary, right? We've been pretty good at the past in dishing out federal dollars um, and reacting. And that's unlikely to change, but what does seem to be shifting, um, and, and we don't want it to change, right? Some of that is completely really important and vital to communities um, bouncing back. But what we are see starting to see is that as part of those recovery efforts, there's sort of a new emphasis on incorporating planning and mitigation into that recovery phase so that we don't build something back um, the same way it was. And then in the case of North Carolina, a year later, you're kind of back revisiting that same asset, that same community or road. Um, how do how do and, and do they these these plans that you both are working on really take that into consideration? The recovery coupled with smart, you know, mitigation and adaptation. Brian, you want to take that? Sure, I can take. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. I don't think that there's a silver bullet um, to answer this question. I think there's some there are some improvements that the feds could make to making sure that recovery funds are more flexible around building back better and including resilience um, and including technical assistance and capacity building for communities. Um, but I think at the state level, um, there's just a lot of sort of groundwork, block and tackle kind of unexciting work that can, that can really play into it. Um, and for example, in Maine, um, the Nature Conservancy a couple of years ago did an inventory of every culvert crossing uh, a public road in Maine. And having that inventory and knowing what condition those culverts are in um, and how um, risky they are uh, to, or vulnerable they are to flooding is really important. So towns uh, and the state can start to pick away at the most vulnerable ones. Um, but we know that um, the biggest change is going to happen when we get uh, a dozen or a hundred blowouts when a big storm hits um, and having uh, both that inventory um, and then some design guidance that the Department of the Environment has put in place around stream smart culverts and expanding culvert size to allow um, greater flood passage and less scouring um, and improve habitat quality um, for fish and other aquatic species. Um, having those guidelines in place um, will help us build back better um, because we've done the hard work of the planning up front. Um, so it can be frustrating to kind of just do things sort of in one-offs and, and do the important groundwork that takes time. Um, but I think it does pay off when we do have an event um, and that we do have federal funding for, and that funding allows us to rebuild better uh, than was there before. And I would 100% agree that the groundwork is critical. And I think the hard lesson that we're learning in North Carolina is that the post-disaster period is not a great period for planning. Um, it seems like this opportunity to have a lot of hard conversations and it is, but there's so much collective trauma after, you know, 2000 people watch their homes wash away that it's just not possible to it's not fair to them to have really difficult conversations like, should your community be rebuilt in the same way? Um, I do think that um, the disaster dollars do provide that planning opportunity and certainly the, the questions get asked, but they don't always get asked in the most constructive way. And there can be this urge to just 
spend the money as soon as as soon as possible. Get it out on the street. We have these dollars. They're disaster survivors that don't have homes, don't have um, a place to sleep. They don't, you know, their fridges are still waterlogged. What are you doing with this money? And so it, there just are a lot of, there's a big combination of factors that make the post-disaster period difficult for ongoing processes. There are processes that, that require sort of ongoing commitment. Um, and I would say that is true, particularly related to equity because, um, taking, building relationships takes time. And, um, in order to infuse equity into our processes uh, as, at a state government level, we need to have good relationships with advocacy organizations, with organizations whose job it is to represent vulnerable communities. Um, and again, those are great relationships to be able to have when you have the disaster. They are very difficult to build in the frenetic post-disaster recovery period. So I will say our state is very committed to building back better, building back more resilient. We're every home that we elevate through our HUD programs is being elevated, um, not just to the 100 year flood level, but to the 100 year flood level or the highest flood of record, whichever is higher. So we are doing a lot of um, work to rebuild more resiliently, particularly as it relates to individual assets. But those more difficult um, collective conversations that require weighing different interests and values. Like those are not uh, conversations that are well suited for the post-disaster period. Yeah, and um, it it tends to be the case that a lot of, um, you know, one of the main mitigation strategies, which is buying out properties that are have repeatedly flooded or that are flood prone occurs um, in that recovery stage. Um, and, you know, we'd like to see a shift towards that happening before the disaster happens. I know for North Carolina, buyouts have been, um, you know, successful, but it's also a heated and sort of controversial um, topic, whether you want to call it buyouts or managed retreat. Um, you know, to me, I always think about buyouts as a step in the process. Um, but it's really sort of the beginning of a step. Um, but, and I know, Amanda, in particular, you've studied this in your former life and um, would lo just love to hear you uh, speak a little bit about, you know, equity considerations in thinking about a buyout or managed retreat strategy. Sure. So um, buyouts, when we approach buyouts as an equity issue, there's this conundrum at the heart of it, which is that um, on one hand, if you spend all your buyout money in wealthy white communities, it looks like you are offering a differential level of support and recovery and mitigation to, to communities that already have more resources. And if you spend all your disaster dollars in, or if you spend all your buyout dollars in low-income communities of color, it looks like you are trying to take them off the map. Um, and both of those things can be true at the same time. It's just a really important way to set the table to even talk about equity is to understand that there's a paradox at the heart of dealing with equity and buyouts. Um, North Carolina is very committed to using buyouts as part of our recovery and resilience strategies. And as part of that, um, the state has made separate commitment out of uh, state dollars to provide additional support for buyout recipients to be able to relocate to equivalent housing elsewhere. Um, often what we see in North Carolina is that um, homes in a floodplain that have been damaged by disaster, even at their pre-flood value, have um, very low values. And for anyone who's sitting in the room in, in a room in like greater DC, um, you really wouldn't believe that we have homes that are valued at $25,000, <laughs> um, $40,000. And you cannot buy another home in North Carolina for that amount. Um, and so my perspective on this and what Laura alluded to is I wrote a dissertation on the challenges of buyouts in low-income African-American communities in North Carolina. Um, the, the, I, I think the direction we need to go is um, to understand the long game for both the communities and for the people who participate. And instead of um, thinking about buyouts as just a, um, you know, we purchase this property, the property becomes open space, 
Um, we need to think about it as a relocation program. We are relocating people out of the floodplain. Well, what do people need to have a successful relocation? And a lot of that involves engaging communities, and there has been historically um, across the nation, there have been um, not the greatest examples of clear communication with communities about buyouts to begin with. Um, but what do households need to be successful? And um, you know, from a community perspective, it's so important to engage engage community voices and a variety of community voices because homes mean something different to everyone. And particularly these, that kind of meaning and value um, can look different for people of different income backgrounds and people of different racial and ethnic backgrounds. Um, for example, in North Carolina, we have um, a now rather famous example of Princeville, which is a, uh, the first town in the United States chartered by African Americans. It was started in um, the 1860s. This is a town that its entire legacy is self-determination in the most unlikely and violent of circumstances. And the fact that they are still standing today, that there's still a community there today is unbelievable what they have been through and what they have survived. They are located in a floodplain. And that is not an accident. And there's been an ongoing conversation should Princeville be relocated? Should we offer buyouts to individual homeowners? And at this point, we're actively having a conversation with, with the town. Um, but I think a lot of people come from the outside and say, it would be so foolish to rebuild Princeville where it is. Well, that's the entire identity of this town is where it is and how it has survived and how they have charted their own future through 150 years and now you have some person from the state capitol, you know, trotting along and saying, you guys should really move next door. It's just, there's a lack of, of understanding. Um, and so anyway, this is an issue that I could talk all day about and I'll try not to, but I think that there's a lot that we can learn from other federal programs that have focused on relocation. We don't, obviously there's very checkered history in the United States of, um, uh, non-consensual relocation efforts. But I think if we look at the past like 30 years, especially of HUD policy, that there's a lot of lessons that we can learn for resilience. Um, and this is something that I've been writing about and thinking about, particularly with our um, relocation efforts around um, HOPE 6 and um, housing, uh, public housing relocation efforts, um, poverty deconcentration efforts, we've learned a lot about what kinds of supports people need to have a successful transition to a new place um, because social networks play an outsized role in the day-to-day -day lives of low-income households. And so losing those social networks can mean losing your right to work or can mean um, losing information about your doctor. So um, anyway, I will leave it at that. There's a lot of equity considerations. There's a lot of room for growth in this field. And I, um, I think that North Carolina is definitely at the front of having these conversations. Thanks. And, you know, buyouts are really about, um, in a way, trying to retrofit some uh, and, and kind of uh, adapt communities that are based on really old data decisions and planning and development decisions, right? Um, made from the 50s and back. Um, but there's the, the the other way of doing, you know, making sure that we're not having this conversation again in 50 years about buyouts in the same community is um, something, Brian, I want to hear you talk about a little bit, which is really mm -hmm. making sure that when you are putting out plans, you are putting out recommendations that you are incorporating future risk uh, with an eye towards not growing your state's risk, right? Um, and let's not go back and have this conversation. So Brian, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, this, this is the holy grail, right? And and so um, I think I'll answer it with an example. So um, as a um, component of the climate action plan, there'll be a recommendation that the state adopt sea level rise projections. Um, and doing that will have um, an official set of numbers out there. It will make um, allowances for those to be updated on a regular basis, um, but it allows agencies and allows towns to start including very real numbers into their planning actions. Um, we have a recommendation to um, do climate-ready design guidance for infrastructure um, that can help the state agencies 
um, when they are re rebuilding a bridge or um, you know building a new wastewater treatment plant, um, that those are taking account for uh, sea level rise projections. Um, and um, in the, we can go farther with those projections and start incorporating them into the use of public funds. Um, how uh, making sure that if public funds are getting spent on projects that those projects are being designed um, with sea level rise in mind uh, over an appropriate lifetime of that project. Um, we can design it into our grant programs so that when communities or uh, organizations are receiving grant funds, um, what they do with those funds uh, have to take sea level rise into consideration. Um, we can think about it in um, you know, procurement criteria and the ways that we offer technical assistance. So there's a lot that we can do once we have um, uh, adopted a set of numbers. Um, and then the next thing we can do is, is with those projections, take a look at how they intersect with social vulnerability. And so part of our process that we've uh, gone through is to um, try to understand how social vulnerabilities overlap with, coincide with and exacerbate physical risk and climate vulnerabilities. Um, and, you know, interesting what we learn um, up the coast in, in down East Maine, where there tends to be a bit more elevation right along the coastline and the shoreline is rockier, um, there, there might be uh, slightly less flood risk um, and sea level rise risk because of the elevation and the type of shorelines that they have. Um, but that's really offset and especially out in the future gets really offset by their social vulnerabilities. Um, and so the ability to um, withstand a storm or a flood event um, and bounce back is, is um, made more challenging because these communities tend to be lower income. Um, and um, so it's important to take into consideration both the physical risk and the projections for physical risk um, along with the social risks that go, that go there. And so a very real example of this could be um, taking a look at where um, climate vulnerable or at-risk infrastructure intersects with socially vulnerable communities. Um, and if you think about their ability to recover from an extreme event or a disruption, um, if we are able to make the infrastructure that they rely on more resilient and more reliable, that's just one less thing that they need to worry about in the course of their recovery. Um, and certainly they'll need other forms of assistance uh, in that event. Um, but having good infrastructure in place because we've prioritized it ahead of time based on the sea level rise projections and based on social vulnerability assessment um, means that their pathway to recovery is, is slightly easier. All right, we've got one more question that I want each of you to answer very quickly before Brad kicks us off. Um, a lot of people, I think, throughout this whole RNPN series have been asking um, how, you know, we talked about stakeholder engagement, um, but there's a lot of folks listening who are sort of ready and eager and at the ready to be part of these processes. What's your advice for um, engagement, either in your state or among you know other states who are going through these processes, Brian, um, I'll give it yeah, to you. Sure. Um, you know, local knowledge is is really important. It's not possible, I don't think, for a state agency or somebody who works at the state level to understand all of the intricacies of every single community in their state. And so, um, I'm a I'm a big fan of citizen science movements. And um, you know that it, they're really great for collecting data and um, knowing what data to collect, what in data is important to a community, um, and 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 um, you know having the will and the excitement to go out there and get it. Um, it also really builds um, networks and relationships within communities that can be relied on later on. Um, and in Maine, we've seen this lead to um, you know in, in our small towns proposals. Um, citizens' proposals to form um, climate action committees or um, other kinds of committees that are volunteer um, and that actually can get a lot of work done in communities. So um, I would really um, encourage citizen science methods, um, both grassroots level um, and supported and supported by the state. And Amanda, I saw you uh, shaking your head, nodding, nodding your head to that. Um, anything to to add to that before we turn off? Yeah, I would encourage. Um, anyone who's interested in building these relationships or to build the relationship is really what I'm going to say is get a meeting 
um, and start talking. If your state has a state resilience officer or somebody who's acting in that position, they might have a different kind of title. Start a, start the conversation. Don't wait for something to happen. Um, and something that we see is that um, nonprofit groups that are more maybe um, politically savvy understand that they can just email us with a question or they can just email us with their recommendation or write a letter and have it signed by their executive director. And I would love to see more of our um, citizen advocates, our, um, you know, other other kinds of nonprofit groups or non-governmental groups that are less active in state government to um, feel the same entitlement to do that. All right, thank you both uh, for your time and also uh, your uh, energy that you put towards this on a daily basis. I thought it was a really fruitful conversation. We didn't we didn't uh, cover everything we weren't able to. I still have a very long list of questions, uh, but I thought it was a great conversation. I'm glad we could spend the hour on this. And Brad, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you, Amanda, Brian, and Laura for a really awesome discussion. Um, we will now take a 10 minute break. We are going to resume just about 2.16. Following the break, we look forward to hearing from Robin Foman, a Mid-Behavioral Health Sales Tax Fund Coordinator with the Department of Community and Human Services in King County, Washington. And then following Robin, we will also hear from Nicole LaBeouf, Acting Assistant Administrator of the National Ocean Service at NOAA, and Michael Grimm, Assistant Administrator for Risk Management at FEMA. Thank you. We'll be back soon. Welcome back. I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, Robin Foman. Robin has worked for over 13 years to address health inequities related to emergencies. In her former role as the manager of the Community Resilience and Equity Program at the Public Health Seattle and King County, Robin collaborated to build strong partnerships between community-based and governmental organizations to facilitate the identification of system level challenges and building collective action. Robin, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Brad. Um, I'm so excited to be with you all today. Um, now that I've moved on from my role at public health um, and public health emergency management, my timing was actually quite well. I missed the COVID response, um, but I've had a time to reflect on my experience and I'm glad to have that opportunity to share it with you all today. Um, what I've prepared to speak with you today um, uh, represents my journey in understanding how institutionalized racism and white supremacy contributes to inequities in our community on a daily basis. And then many of us notice this in an emergency, but these are the same inequities that are really happening every day in our communi communities and are only magnified in emergencies. I've come to understand that this really shouldn't be a surprise to any of us. Um, really, when you really step back and understand how our systems and institutions work and that there is a built-in preference for white people and that our systems were designed to be this way. Um, so it shouldn't be a surprise. And this is what is called institutional and or systemic structural racism. To start, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, King County, Washington, uh, where Seattle is located. Um, over the past several years, I mean, we've been working actually in, in both the city of Seattle and King County government for probably 15 to 20 years 
on addressing equity and social justice. And then the city of Seattle has really had a race and social justice initiative um, that's focused on. Um, it's a progressive area, primarily, especially the Seattle area. And even um, several years ago, our county council actually changed what was historically just King County to actually be called Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, County. So within that context, I just wanted to also um, show you this map that I typically use um, when I'm starting any presentation around um, King County and just um, when we talk about health equity. So these, um, you know, King County is actually rated quite high as in overall health of the populations, but these healthy outcomes don't apply to everyone. On these maps, blue means good and red means poor health outcomes. It will likely come as no surprise that the blue, which is the north part of Seattle, represents a majority white, wealthier area of the city, while the red, the areas that are not doing as well, are majority communities of color and lower income. It's, in fact, actually, the University of Washington's Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation conducted a study um, on data through 2015 um, a neighborhood level study that revealed disparities in life and income as high as 18 years for men and 14 years for women in some areas of the county, meaning that in some neighborhoods, a man's in the north area or the east area where it's wealthier and um, mostly white, a man's life expectancy on average was 18 years longer than men in some of the poorer neighborhoods in South King County or in South Seattle. So I just wanna say that these maps aren't unique to the Seattle King County area. I am sure that in any community that of you who are listening on this call today, your maps, if you looked at health disparities by race and income would look very similar and maybe not necessarily in the same segregated way that Seattle um, is, but in, in, the, in the, the segregation within your community. So I want to talk about where I really started my journey. Um, first of all, August 2005, we all know Hurricane, Hurricane Katrina um, hit. And that was um, kind of a wake up call, I think, around emergency preparedness and a lot of work um, initially stemmed out of there. Um, Seattle was preparing to receive evacuees from the Gulf Coast and public health staff were engaged in this effort. And there were some realizations at that point that we, if, if something similar had happened in King County, Washington, we would have had the same disproportionate impacts on our more marginalized communities as what occurred in New Orleans. In fact, and, and, and so in, nine, in 20, 200, 2005, they actually formed a new program at Public Health um, that they named the Vulnerable Populations Action Team. And in 2006, I was hired as the program manager for this team, what, we became, what became known as VPAT. The program was really old school emergency management. We had defined which groups were considered to be more vulnerable to health disparities during and after an emergency. And we focused on building capacity with community organizations so that they could withstand the disaster and continue to provide services to their clients. At this point in our work, it was really a one dimensional effort. We didn't call out black indigenous or communities of color as being a group of vulnerable, vulnerable to health disparities. And then we started, you know, we still, and I, I, I heard a lot of this language um, still being used as vulnerable populations, which, you know, from my experience, um, a lot of emergency management was moving away from that language. And in fact, at public health, um, we have changed the language to groups impacted by inequities. Um, and then that is really to acknowledge that these folks aren't just vulnerable accidentally. Um, they're vulnerable because our systems have created vulnerability. And I would say um, specifically, or even most pronounced for people of color, especially black and indigenous uh, folks. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about what um, my colleague has often described um, our origins, um, our origin story on the next several slides. And this is sort of the event I think that chartered the course um, forward, especially for my work. So from the night of Thursday, December 14th through Friday, December 15th in 2006, a 
a, a very significant windstorm ravaged Washington, leaving millions of, of residents um, without power during very cold weather. The night of the storms, the, drop, the temperatures dropped to freezing. Millions of residents struggled to stay warm in the dark as another threat emerged, which was carbon monoxide poisoning. People, particularly immigrants who had cooked outside safely on charcoal grills, moved them indoor for warmth, only to become ill and overcome by a carbon An air, our area emergency room saw several hundred poisoning victims and the Seattle Times devoted on its front page on Wednesday, December 20th, notices in six languages, English, Russian, Vietnamese, Chinese, Somali, and Spanish, cautioning residents against burning charcoal indoors. This final photo is of a young Vietnamese man whose entire family died from carbon monoxide poisoning caused by putting a generator in their attached garage. It was a terrible lesson and again, one that set me on this course, uh, learning many of the lessons I, I'm going to share with you today. So then in 20, 2009, we experienced the swine flu. Um, and during the time before this, we, you know, my colleague and I had worked to become much more culturally competent. We proudly began not only translating information into other language, but we even started featuring the community members we were trying to reach. So in this flyer, for instance, there's a Somali community leader with her daughter. This is advertising um, information about the, the swine flu. In fact, it translates directly into Somali as the title slide as avoid swine flu. Well, it turned out to us, uh, it turned out, um, we had to learn later, that the word for pig or swine in Somali is really not a good word. Um, and as a nearly all Muslim country, Somali people had nothing to do with pigs. And the word for pig is, is considered derogatory and certainly not halal. And so it was, even though we thought we were doing this great work, um, we didn't have all the information we needed. We were maybe trying to be more culturally competent, but we weren't at all culturally responsive. And so in 2011, I, we had the opportunity, I got a small grant and we focused on better understanding communications in the Somali community. We had learned through the carbon monoxide poisoning and also the swine flu um, episodes as, as well as a few other um, kind of lessons learned over the course of those years that we really needed to better understand how to communicate um, rapidly and tested message and how do we disseminate them in the Somali community. Um, and so um, typically when I worked on a project with community partners, I would contract with a community-based organization embedded in the community and would pay, for the, pay them for access to their community. And that's kind of a long standing approach. And it was actually an approved upon approach to what public health had historically done. Um, early on the project, I was reminded by a Somali friend that I should reach out to Muhammad Ali. After all, this was a public health project and he was a Somali man with a master's in public health. I didn't realize at the time, but this accidental decision to partner with Muhammad on this effort was pivotal. Together, we interviewed key community leaders and held a focus group to better understand communication channels, health beliefs, and vaccine uptake. When we discussed how to sustain a communication mechanism, the folks that we had interviewed in the focus group, they suggested we continue to meet in order to maintain relationships built during the, the project. Mohammed and I knew that meeting regularly to focus on emergency preparedness would be short-lived. It would be also tone deaf. During our research, we had identified so many health issues and concern that it was clear that health needed to be the focus. In summer of 2012, we formally established the Somali Health Board, which began as quarterly meetings. Mohammed brought Somali health professionals to the table and I brought health system partners. The Somali health leaders led the meetings. The first meeting was focused on setting up the health board, the second focused on prenatal labor and delivery, and the third on mental health. Here's one of our quarterly meetings. In 2012, just let me back up. Public health, our role at public health and setting up the Somali Health Board was really assisting with notes taking, roster, and maintaining the roster and distribution list, um, as well as levering connections with 
other health systems that help bring speakers and eventually resources to that work. In early 2012, we had another big storm, what the newscasters called Snowmageddon. This time was different. Um, the Somali community managed a community-wide response through the Somali Health Board and led by Muhammad Ali. Muhammad worked with the biggest mosque in the county, convincing them to robocall all of their members to warn them about the snow, about the storm, storm and remind them about the dangers of carbon monoxide poisoning. And even this was a feat. Forecasting, relying on weather forecasts was not typically um, something that uh, the mosque would do. I mean, only Allah would be able to know what the weather is. So Mohammed was really the only person who could compel them or convince them how important it was. Um, also the experience related to the carbon monoxide poisoning back in 2006. He included his personal felt phone cell phone number on the message. The day of the storm, Mohammed received many calls. The mosque in fact rented a four wheel drive vehicle and transported families without power to friends that had it. They also sheltered a family with a child with autism at the mosque. In 2013, Mohammed was honored with a FEMA Champion of Change Award for his role in this response. For us at Public Health, it was another lesson. One of the communities we had identified as vulnerable, refugee and immigrants, were actually more resilient than we could have imagined. We also learned that many communities, particularly communities of color, inherently had the capacity and the loving motivation to care for their own communities no matter what. Over the next several years, the Somali Health Board continued to meet on a quarterly basis. Public Health continued to support them for their first several years with some administrative assistance that eventually included grant writing. In 2014, 2015, with the help of the small grant, the Somali Health Board became a nonprofit organization with expanding programming focused on the health of their community. From nutrition classes, to addressing stigma to mental, of mental health and to their annual health fairs. So the Somali Health Board also grew as a partner to public health. With the health expertise of their leadership, they conducted outreach related to potential measles outbreak, developed a culturally responsive vaccination comic book, and now are playing a central role in keeping their community educated and safe from COVID. It was during this, oh, and here's a little bit, oh, actually, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. It was during this time that we changed the name of my program to Equity and Community Response or Community Resilience. And it was really because of lessons learned from um, the work with the Somali Health Board. So what has started as these quarterly meetings became a model of community-owned health and resilience that we could never had anticipated when we began those quarterly meetings. It was clear that the Somali Health Board and the Community Health Board model they created was significant by focusing on health, which ultimately underlies every emergency or disaster and certainly climate change um, as well. We could build sustainable communication and, and or resilience models. As a community created and led organization, it also offered another lesson one that I couldn't articulate at a time, but that a lesson in white paternalism, which is embedded in so many of our institutions. It, you know, I started this work thinking I needed to come in to help them. And the reality is we learned how much they could help us. And so over the next several years, I worked to to replicate this model in other communities. Um, and so in 2017, I um, helped initiate just with really small grants, um, the Latinx Health Board, African American Health Board, the Ethiopian Health Council, the Eritrean Health Board, Pacific Islander Health Board, Vietnamese Health Board, Khmer Health Board, Congolese, and of course the Somali Health Board. And this was done mostly because I, you know, I, at this time I had been in my position for at least 10 years, which is unusual. And, but I, I think so much of my ability, particularly as a white person, to be able to pull this off was because my longstanding relationships and the fact that I evolved so much in this position. And here's a quick picture, uh, that was a quick picture of the Vietnamese health board. So eventually it made sense to bring the different health boards together. 
This was a time where a new levy had passed that was focused on funding community organizations to build capacity within communities. So the timing was right. Money might be available to support capacity building. At the first meeting, seeing so many com commonalities of the issues their communities face, folks decided it made sense to continue to meet on a monthly basis, eventually leading to the formation of the Community Health Board Coalition. So these are some of their early meetings that I was a part of. For two years, I attended the coalition meetings, usually as the only white person in the room. It was an experience that I feel uh, grateful for and humbled by. Initially, as with the beginning of the Somali Health Board, public health provided administrative support with meeting notes, maintaining rosters, and again, help with grant writing. But in early 20, 20, 2019, they asked me to no longer attend these meetings. Ouch. They told me it's not because you are white, but because you acted white. What? This was the first time I was impacted race by racism personally. And I realized, and I was so sad by it. I, I'm, I cried a lot about this experience. I felt so sad not to be able to stay connected to this group. And I just realized how evil and diabolical racism is. It kept me from being connected to the people I loved and cared about deeply. And then I really started thinking, what does it mean to act white? Was it because I felt like I could participate if I knew what they experienced? Was it because I thought they should focus on climate change even though that wasn't their immediate priority? Is it because I thought they needed me? It became clear to me that even though I sat with them on a monthly basis, I still didn't understand the experience of their communities. I didn't know how to listen. I thought they needed me. And ultimately, I didn't know there was an alternative option to all I've ever known to all I've ever been taught. And then I started learning more about what it means to act white. I started thinking about all the messages I received that reinforce what is on this slide. White should have dominance over people of color backgrounds, of other backgrounds, especially where they may coexist. White should live by themselves in a whites only society, the history of redlining in this country. White people have their own culture that is superior to other cultures and white people are genetically superior to other people. And believe it or not, we learn this. So face it, white folks who are listening to me, somehow we all learn this and we've all lived it. And it shows up in the fact that I was the one doing this job. It shows up in the fact that most of our institutions and most emergency managements and probably staff at NOAA and FEMA are predominantly white. Um, and I was thinking, you know, how did this happen? Was it because I watched too many shows when I was young that only had white people, Gilligan's Island or Charlie's Angels? And ultimately, of course, it's way more insidious than that. Somewhere along the way, we made a pack. My family did. Give up our cultural identities and become white. For my Polish mother, it was her, when her parents refused to teach her Polish, to speak to her in Polish and to teach her Polish. Instead of being Polish, she could be white. So white people listening to this, we've all benefited from this privilege and we still do. All my slides are out of order. So, and what does this all have to do with community resilience? I took a training years ago by the People's Institute out of New Orleans. One of the most amazing trainings about undoing institutionalized racism that you can take and I highly recommend. And one of the components of their training included this power analysis, which asked the question of why are people poor? They call this the foot of oppression. On this picture, it's hard to see to some extent, it shows a poor community that is being trampled. As we heard earlier, um, when we were talking about where flood zones are, or where impacts um, near environmental pollution are, and we heard it's not an accident that people of color or poor communities live in these areas. It was intentional. And institutions, usually white-led, have historically and systema systematically, albeit not always entirely intentionally, pulled decision-making power away from the communities they seek to empower or serve. And as a result, the power to influence health and economic and social resources lie almost entirely outside 
of the hands of poor communities. And that's what this picture is about. We call it the project, the hood, the ghetto, barrio, Chinatown, Little Korea, reservation, trailer park. And you see all these different systems doing into these communities. The white paternalism, we are here to save you, trust us, we know best. And we talk about these communities as disadvantaged, disconnected, targeted, under the radar, employed, underemployed, I'm sorry, at risk, black, low income, socioeconomic, and we also call them vulnerable. And this is white paternalism at its best. Residents can't rise and thrive because we haven't let them. The long held position of they don't deserve what we have, that they don't need to be taken care of, or that they need to be taken care of, harken back to slavery and are now embedded in our systems. We created, oh, I just wanna go back to this. And we created these areas in each and every one of our communities, housing projects or ghettos. The impacts of Hurricane Katrina was not an accident. It was pred predictable. This is why our maps look the way they do. This is why the life expectancy rates in some neighborhoods of Seattle or King County differ so much from one part of the county to the other. And this exists in your neighborhoods as well. So I've been thinking a lot about what it means to act white and what is the alternative. I mean, how can you imagine an alternative to acting white when it's all you've ever known? Fortunately, I had two years of participating in a group that wasn't operating through a white cultural lens, and it was different. Back when the SHB was starting, I was solely focused on communication the communication mechanism. In addition to that, I built deep and long standing relationships with my Somali colleagues who now call me Shankaron, which means the value of more than five men. Obvious, when I was meeting on the coalition, I valued my professionalism as a public health employee when it was really the grassroots knowledge of the community that was so powerful. For me, it actually comes down to valuing, valuing people for being rather than doing. In my life, I never felt like enough for just being how I am. I was taught I was valuable for what I did. And I imagine some of you can relate to that. And so looking, looking at these differences, I just wanted to kind of emphasize that. So the relationship oriented, you know, statistics that tend to be white, evidence-based statistics versus stories, rules versus creativity, linear versus circular ways of thinking. Um, quick fix versus the long-term relationships. Again, the professionalism versus the grassroots knowledge, expertise versus leadership development, individualism versus the collective. And for me, one, this is one of the biggest things. We have been raised to only watch out for ourselves, to put ourselves forward, to raise ourselves up for the, by our bootstraps. And that's not how a lot of communities of color work. And it goes back to being hierarchical versus community and ultimately white privilege versus social equity. But ultimately though, I think this is all about our own humanity. As, a, as white people, we are taught that we are separate, different and better. We've been sold a lie. My goal these days is to evolve in my anti-racism. Right now I'm still in the learning zone after all of the years, but I'm moving forward toward the growth zone. I'm not doing this simply as an ally, I'm doing this for myself and my connection to my own heart. I think this is where white people need to get to. This is not making sure we get the biggest piece of the pie. It's not about saving people of color with our white voices. It's about our own hearts and our connections to each other as humans. And so in conclusion, I just wanna share some of the, the more tangible lessons. Um, for you, um, and then when also when thinking about these equitable outcomes that occurred after Hurricane Katrina or the maps from King County, just remembering that these outcomes were deliberately created by the systems in which we work, by the systems we as white folks benefit from at the expense of others. And so again, in conclusion, I just wanna give you some maybe intermediate or beginning steps. I know many of you may be fairly new in your jobs or new in this work. And again, I had the benefit of being in the same position for 13 years, which you know I think is, is un, an unusual, but I really grew a lot in this work. And so my first recommendation would be to really educate yourselves about institutionalized and systemic racism. 
Consider how racism is impacting your own humanity. Uh, hire black and indigenous and people of color. They know this stuff already. I promise you it would not have taken another, if a person of color had been in my position, it would not have taken them 13 years to kind of finally kind of start understanding this. Although it didn't, it, I learned some of it earlier in that, but people come in knowing this stuff. Recognizing existing capacity and expertise in the community. I mean, we totally discovered this untapped resource that has always existed around health priorities and health leadership that we just never gave room to, to have a voice. Build long-term relationships. Don't have a predetermined agenda. When we started those quarterly meetings with the Somali Health Corps Board, I had no idea what it was going to turn out. And I certainly couldn't have even imagined how amazing they would have they made it and what a teacher they've become. Uh, provide capacity building support, leverage the credibility of your institution for grant writing and convening. Um, and remember, especially for white people, this is not just a job. It doesn't happen during office hours. This is about our community. And when I work with community or people of color um, as public health began hiring more people of color who were very much embedded in the community health board coalition and represented in the various health boards, I saw that front and center. These weren't people that wouldn't come in on a Saturday to do work like many of my white colleagues. And, Bill, and then finally, and the hard lesson that I had to learn is being willing to step out of the way and let go. Because ultimately, this is not about me. This is so much bigger and there's so much work to be done. So finally, keep at it. It's going to take a lifelong commitment. It took a long time to get where we are now. And we're going to need everybody's um, kind of self-analysis and commitment to doing this work to make a change in our lifetime. Thanks, Brad. Back to you. Robin, thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, we hope you stay he uh, safe and healthy in Seattle. Thanks. And um, really, thank you for sharing your journey with us. It, it, was, mm -hmm. uh, it was really enlightening and, and helpful. And I think there's a lot to be taken from your, you know, over a decade worth of experience doing this work. It's, it's really fantastic. So, so thank you again. Um, Thanks, Brad. You're welcome. I'm excited to announce our, our next two speakers. Uh, first, uh, Nicole LaBeouf, Acting Assistant Administrator of the National Ocean Service at NOAA, and then followed by Mike Grimm, Assistant Administrator for Risk Management at FEMA. Uh, we're excited to feature these two uh, federal leaders as they speak on their agency's respective commitments toward equity moving forward and paving the, the way for uh, you know a collective year of action. Uh, Nicole, the floor is yours. Thank you, Brad. It is an honor to be helping FEMA um, and everyone associated with this forum close out a month long series on Alliance for Equity. Thank you to FEMA for inviting NOAA to have such an engaged role in this extended meeting. Earlier this month, um, you may have heard remarks from my NOAA colleagues, Dr. Louis Uccellini, the Assistant Administrator of the National Weather Service, as well as Dr. Jeff Payne, the Director of NOS's Office for Coastal Management. I hope that our comments complement one another and that you'll take away from all three of us that NOAA is committed to prepare everyone for our nation in our nation for hazardous weather and water events and that we recognize the importance of trust and longstanding partnerships with one another and with communities to ensure that NOAA's authoritative data are understood and useful for all. I am grateful that the theme of this forum is about alliances, and I've only had a chance to hear portions of the forum, but I can tell that I'm in the right place and in good company, and that we have much in common and in complementarity to support one another in alliances for equity. I strongly believe that no matter the issue, federal agencies have a responsibility to work cooperatively and seamlessly with one another and with communities to deliver the very best service possible to the American people all of the American people. In doing so, in any circumstance, there must be open communication, a focus on playing to our strengths, and the commitment to not just leverage, but to elevate the strengths and contributions of others. In highly complex and changing conditions like those related to the impacts of weather and water events, there's no time to spare tripping over one another or arguing about who does what. We must make the most of every moment and of every move. 
That is why I'm so pleased that NOAA has this role in the forum and I'm optimistic that through events like these, we can all find our rightful places to prepare our nation for what's to come. To succeed in these preparations, we will also have to be persistent and creative. Two traits on full display in the work of the event coordinators and everyone involved in making this forum happen after many attempts at doing so. Climate change and coastal impacts wait for no man, no woman, and no pandemic. And we must press on and we have. So I'd like to say thank you and well done to the conference organizers. This has been a great series and a great success. At NOAA's National Ocean Service, our mission is centered around measuring, predicting, and assessing risks to coastal communities from the impacts of coastal change, including inundation and sea level rise, among others. Our nation's coastal zone, including the Great Lakes, is the home and playground of hundreds of millions of people and serves as a key driver of our nation's health and economic prosperity. 126 million people live within U.S. coastal counties, that's 40% of the U.S. population in 10% of our land mass. In 2018, our coastal communities and industries, also known of as the blue economy, contributed nearly $373 billion to our nation's GDP and grew at a faster rate than our nation's economy as a whole. In fact, it is nearly impossible for most Americans to go a single day without eating, wearing, or using products that either come from or through our blue economy. I don't have to tell this crowd that it is within this highly dynamic portion of our nation's economy that we are experiencing increasing environmental change, hazardous conditions, and events such as flooding and hurricanes. As I speak, Hurricane Zeta has just become a category two hurricane and is expected to make landfall in Southeast Louisiana this afternoon bringing a multi-threat hazard to an already battered area. If the, the current forecast holds, significant impacts are expected across portions of Southeast Louisiana and Southern Mississippi with storm surge of six to nine feet of inundation from the mouth of the Pearl River to the Mississippi-Alabama state line. My thoughts are always with coastal communities as the storm approaches. Growing up on the Texas Gulf Coast myself, I know what it's like to watch a hurricane come in and to ride one out. The United States has experienced $1.75 trillion, that's trillion with a T, dollars worth of damage from weather and climate related events since 1980. If we continue on the current path by 2050, as much as $106 billion worth of coastal property will likely be under sea level making com key communities and industries even more vulnerable to coastal disasters. After 2017 and 2018 hurricane seasons, Congress appropriated to the National Ocean Service alone $119 million in supplemental funds toward hurricane recovery efforts, including marine debris assessments and recovery, hydrographic and shoreline surveys, and observing system repairs. These pots of money, as we've heard from previous panelists, are, have limited purposes for spending, and they are not a sustainable solution. They are expensive, and their focus is most often on repairing damage, not on preparing for future events. Post-disaster funding is becoming a significant drain on our nation's finances and only begins to cover the direct and indirect costs to our coastal communities. So let's talk about these costs, direct, indirect, and how unevenly they are spread. A hurricane comes in and everyone feels the same wind. Everyone's, get, everyone's feet get wet with the same water. One could argue that the impacts of climate change and of coastal change will be felt by everyone. And in some respects, this is true. However, the effects will be highly variable and will be over a multitude of types. They will be localized and widespread. And it's not just the initial impacts that are so concerning, not even close. It's about how well communities are able to prepare for an event and how well they are able to, and how comprehensively they are able to recover afterward. These are the attributes at the heart of resilience, and this is where the inequities lie. 
the long-term impacts of coastal storms and other hazards are already being exacerbated by socioeconomic disparities with and among communities along our coasts. From the ability to evacuate safely to whether someone has insurance to repair or rebuild, from whether a home that's destroyed is a primary residence or a vacation house, and from whether one's income depends on marginal sectors of an economy that may or may not come back after a major event. These are just some of the differences in resilience where real vulnerability lies. Along our coasts, minority communities are often underserved and underrepresented, and they face a myriad of inequities in terms of their ability to plan, to recover, and to remain resilient in the face of coastal change. As was referenced in the preceding talk, I also recall the television images of the 2005, in 2005, of people stranded on their roofs and on highways in and around New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina devastated the area. I recall being on the phone with a dear friend. She'd grown up in New Orleans. I was dismayed at how many people of color had been left to fend for themselves. Her response? This is how they've always been treated, without services, without support, without lifelines otherwise available to white people. Of course, my friend was right. She's still right. This is still the case when it comes to underserved communities whose resilience to the lasting impacts from physical, financial, and mental strain from coastal hazards can be long lasting. Disparities, of course, are exacerbated in crisis and the long-term impacts are nothing less than adding insult to injury where communities are unable to bounce back. Yes, it is true, everyone's feet will get wet with the same water, but not everyone will be able to buy new dry shoes. It is up to us to keep up the conversation about resilience and equity, and when we frequently turn our attention to episodic events on the television, that we keep these things going in between. It is up to us to operationalize filling these equity gaps between catastrophic events. And it of course is not just catastrophic events that can have long-term impacts and can expose inequities. Chronic stressors like sea level rise and high tide flooding have become an ever-present reality across our nation. Annual high tide flood rates are accelerating in nearly 50 East and Gulf Coast locations with some cities experiencing high tide flooding 10, 20, or more times per year. People in these locations are already being forced to adapt to flooding in their daily routines. Just last week, I heard from a partner with the New York City Mayor's Office of Resiliency who shared a story about a city bus driver. This bus driver cannot afford to be late to, his, to start his route. He does not have the luxury to work from home or just get another job. So every day, this bus driver text, checks the tide tables. Then he decides how and when to get to work. For a 7 a.m. shift, he wakes up at 5 a.m. And if flooding is predicted, he drives in his car to a location near the bus that he will be driving and sits in his car for nearly two hours before his shift begins. Let that sink in for a moment. Is he resilient to coastal change? I'm not asking about whether or not he's resourceful. That is clear, he is. He's figured out a, made, a way to make this work for now. I'm asking about the possibility that it could be one or two high tide flooding events that make his job vulnerable. One or two high tide flooding events that either we or he does not predict well could be a big difference in his life. And what is he missing while he's sitting for his car in two hours? For two hours, childcare, essential errand running, home maintenance, just rest. I don't know what else he's sacrificing, but I do know that this is just one story. And I think of the myriad of other individuals whose daily lives are being impacted by changes along the coasts. As the pace and extent of coastal flooding and erosion accelerate, climate change impacts along our coast will continue to disrupt our daily lives and will further exacerbate pre-existing social inequities. At the National Ocean Service, providing authoritative data and information is at the core of what we do. 
people are increasingly looking to NOAA and the Ocean Service in particular for information critical to making decisions about the lives, their lives in the coastal zone. In that regard, NOAA and NOS are trusted and traditional players in this space. When it comes to preparing for, responding to, and recovering from the impacts of climate and coastal change, NOAA is here for the long haul. That is why NOS and the Weather Service jumped at the chance to stand shoulder to shoulder with FEMA and others at this forum to express our commitment to not just science, but to service. NOAA is well known as a science agency, but helping people is also at the core of NOAA's identity. At NOAA, that means service to all, regardless of ethnicity, socioeconomic standing, or other aspects of who we are as humans that might otherwise divide us. When it comes to planning for climate change, all of us need to be ready, and all of us deserve to be readied. And I would suggest there are roles for everyone who is willing to step up, play to their strengths, and serve as agents of positive change. So what does that entail? To achieve a resilient future, we need science and data, of course. But we also need real, difficult conversations about how to act on that data, about who benefits and who pays under different approaches, about social and environmental equity, and about what kind of future we want for everyone. We need to better serve the underserved. And I'm proud to say that serving everyone, or at least striving in earnest to do so, is one of NOAA's superpowers. It is one of our strengths. For example, NOS's Office for Coastal Management recognizes that our work must include learning from community leaders and listening to those who have historically been denied a seat at the table. In our online decision support tools and training, we incorporate critical information, both demographic and economic, focused on those who will bear the brunt of the impacts of climate change the elderly, children, households where English is not the first language, and those who live in poverty. One of NOAA's most valuable assets is our ability to convene and to foster and maintain longstanding partnerships rooted within coastal communities. These partnerships are founded on trust and credibility. And so as we choose to stand together in this work, we do not need to start from scratch and quite frankly, we do not have the time. We can and should build upon and leverage existing partnerships. NOAA is here to help with that. And we need to listen and learn from one another and from coastal communities, making addressing social vulnerabilities a priority in adaptation planning and decision-making. NOAA is here to help with that too. Decisions must incorporate strategies for protecting historically marginalized communities, as well as consider the impacts of future, of, on the future of, our future of our coastal communities and the sectors of the economy that they so vibrantly support. And when I look at NOAA's very own data, I know that we must commit ourselves to doing all of this good work with haste not by floundering about, but by building on a foundation of existing trust and relationships, by playing to our strengths and by elevating those of others as we stand together preparing for the future. With you all and with the communities that need our help, NOAA is proud to be an ally for equity. Speaking of standing shoulder to shoulder, it is now my privilege to introduce our next speaker, a great friend to NOAA, Mr. Michael Grimm. Mr. Grimm is FEMA's Assistant Administrator for Risk Management. He directs FEMA's rich, risk, risk management programs to prioritize federal investments to mitigate for mitigation and resilience, implementing higher codes and standards for federal action, and by assisting communities in reducing disaster costs. Mike, the mic is yours. Good, thank you, Nicole, and good afternoon, everybody. I want to echo the, the thanks to, to Noah uh, for, for being with us and standing, standing next to each other uh, to lead and thank our teams uh, for the ability to, to pull this event off over the last four weeks and our, and our contract support as well. Um, looking back, I want to 
reflect on a, a few things uh, over the last four weeks. I'm starting, starting with a quote from Dr. Jeff Payne, the director of NOAA's Office for Coastal Management from day two of the series, uh, because it really represents my perspective uh, on the topic of equity and resilience. Um, and, and, and what Jeff said was, uh, while I personally have uh, a little bit to offer, a little, a little bit to offer, um, I always have a lot to learn. And, and that's really been the, the case for me. It's absolutely true. I believe it's the case for the organization I lead in risk management and for the Federal Insurance Administration. And, and overall, I believe it's true for uh, the resilience community overall. You know, on the first, first three days, we explored topics such as inclusive planning, resilient and affordable housing, financing, uh, equitable resilience, and how climate and natural disasters disproportionately impact underserved or marginalized populations. Uh, part of the discussions uh, focused around the COVID-19 pandemic and, and how it's unleashed unimaginable pain and suffering across the country and truly exacerbated inequities. Uh, but it's important to remember what Valerie Novak from uh, the Center for American Progress pointed out last week. And, and what she said was that COVID is really, what, what COVID has really done is shine the light on a lot of inequities that, that people have been talking about for a very long time. Uh, you know, bottom line, these are not new issues, but in many cases, they've been overlooked or, or not necessarily regarded as critical to the success of resilient initiatives, and that's got to change. You know, Valerie went on to add that, I can't help wonder how much would have changed if we would have committed more to inclusive communities uh, before we were even talking about inclusive emergency response. And, you know, I gotta say Valerie's spot on. It's much like resilience, equity is inherently connected to every part of a community and we can't look at resilience or equity in a vacuum. We need to understand communities thoroughly uh, and then work collaboratively and, and supportively to advance equitable resilience. Uh, but we, we still have, you know, it's still a work in progress as an organization and, and as a movement and, and as a society. You know, we continue to experience these repetitive cycles of disasters and inequities. And as, as Dr. Martin highlighted in her keynote, uh, you know, we see after, she said, we, we've seen disaster after disaster, the same pattern of events. And, you know, Nicole, as you point out, nature is oblivious to this. Um, many, many folks over the last uh, four weeks have, have talked about how our country's experiencing more frequent and severe disasters and how we're seeing firsthand the escalating financial and human costs um, of the weather events and the health events. <clears throat> you know, according, uh, Nicole, I, I know you know this because it came from your shop, according to NOAA Center for Environmental Information, uh, the U.S. has experienced $10 billion disaster events this year as of July. Uh, making 2020 the sixth consecutive year uh, to reach that mark. And, you know, this doesn't even include the, the Midwest derecho, the uh, hurricanes, Marco, Laura, Sally, and dozens of active wildfires across the West. Um, and, you know, for context, 2019 had $10 billion disaster events for the entire year. Uh, so we're, we're well ahead at the moment. Um, you know, 2020 hurricane season started earlier than ever before. And am I, my staff, my team, the FEMA team overall, and many agencies were mobilized early and for a long time. And of course, it was predicted to be a very active season, and we're seeing that really play out in real time. Uh, you know, the season, we've already seen the most amount of storms in the shortest amount of time in recorded history. And as the Hurricane Center uh, uh, found, they ran out of names uh, for only the second time. Uh, and September, we had five named storms in the Atlantic for the first time ever. And Hurricane Laura, of course, uh, that, was, that was huge, right? It became one of the 10 hurricanes on record to make landfall with winds of 150 miles per hour or higher. And the second of this strength uh, to strike Louisiana since records began in 1851. I mean, that's just mind-boggling mind to me. And as you pointed out, Nicole, that uh, now we have Hurricane Zeta about to make landfall uh, today. Um, so there's, there's no question that the negative impacts from these events disproportionately impact marginalized and underrepresented populations. So, you know, let, let's talk about what are the steps that we can take to address the disproportionate impacts. On, on day, day one, Dion Ferris said that addressing equity requires acknowledgement of the harms and respect for and inclusion of 
the voices and the interests that people are harmed the most. And though many of us individually or within our organizations are increasing our own awareness and learning how to more proactively incorporate equity into resilience initiatives um, as we work to mitigate the risks, but awareness is only one piece of that puzzle. You know, the ideal state is to incorporate equity into our organization's objectives and goals and plans and strategies, uh, and then implementing solutions, equitable solutions to reduce disaster suffering. So let me let me stop for a second and step back and talk about what our organization at FEMA, the Federal Insurance at Federal Insurance and Mitigation Administration, FIMA, we call it, uh, has done. We, we just literally released our final and finalized our uh, three-year strategy for the fiscal years 21 through 23. And the path that we laid out is ambitious. Uh, and, and I believe it, display, it displays a lot of introspection for the ways uh, that our organization might make a difference in this space and how we can elevate our actions and our actions across the resilience landscape. One of the strategies, two principles, is to deliver our programs with equity to increase resilience of all communities. Uh, let me say that again. One of, the, one of the written strategies in our FY21 to 23 document and strategy is to deliver our programs with equity to increase resilience of all communities. And, and what that means is we're committing to include underserved, marginalized, and vulnerable po po populations in all of our efforts so that our programs work for everyone, okay? Now, our, our introspection begins with two foundational questions. Where are the weaknesses in our operations and our program delivery, and how can we address them? And how can we encourage our partners, including all of you here today, to make that same commitment? Now, the commitment's not simple, and we certainly don't have the answers at the moment what we're ready and willing to explore. FEMA is ready and willing to explore. We know that equity is complex and resilience is complex. But what we heard from most of the speakers this week and over the course of this month is that they can't be disparate efforts. We both must be ingrained into everything we do moving forward, not just today, not just this month of October where we're doing the RNPN or next month but every month and month after that and year after that. So on day, on day three, uh, Jesse Hanforth Combe from HUD was asked about what she sees as a goal for the near term. And she, she, spoke, of, uh, she spoke of commitment saying, continue the conversation about how we weave together equity and resilience uh, with all these other social problems that we've been dealing with for many, many years. And, and she followed up with a question of, how do we have the conversation moving forward so that we can incrementally make progress because there is no silver bullet? You know, sporadic or occasional discussions, I think we all know, focused on equity and resilience just hasn't pulled us from this recurring cycle of disaster suffering. So, you know, this forum, this, this Alliances for Equity Forum is just the beginning for us. And I truly believe that, you know, the first time that, that my agency and organization has embedded these principles into our strategy, is a fantastic first step, uh, but we do have to deliver. We do have to deliver. And, you know, I, I wanna finish by mentioning also an objective in that strategy, and it's about catalyzing community partnerships to promote sustained and equitable investments in risk reduction. You know, I believe we've, we've already seen the power of partnership through this event. Uh, and without the support of, of NOAA, specifically the National Weather Service and the National o Ocean Service, uh, uh, the investment from all of our speakers and, and everyone's attendance, um, you know, this, this event would, wouldn't have been nearly as impactful. So, um, you know, again, thank, thank you to you all. To you all. Uh, but we, we also have to recognize, and, and Nicole, as you pointed out, no one agency or organization or individual can do this alone. And, and that was a theme throughout this conference, uh, this workshop. Uh, no, no, no one can do this alone. And, you know, the discussion of the past month is critical in value. We know the discussion must be followed with action. And action is where uh, the only way we will achieve the change necessary to create equitable and resilient future for all. Uh, in closing, uh, I just, once again, I really wanna thank NOAA for their unwavering support in this event and all of our speakers and the attendees. 
uh, for all the passion, the involvement, the energy, you know, as, as we continue to share, uh, you know, continue to go after these shared pursuits together uh, uh, as one. So um, thank you. And um, Brad, I'm going to uh, turn it back to you to close out the event. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Nicole and Mike. Um, it would be an understatement that um, without the support of Noah and FEMA on this, um, we just would not have had the success. Um, and so we really appreciate your leadership throughout the planning and delivery of the Alliances for Equity Forum. On day one, I mentioned that it wasn't long ago the RNPN uh, was simply an idea. And over the last five years, uh, with your support and engagement, we took the Resilient Nation Partnership Network from an idea and built it into a unique and impactful network of organizations and individuals. Um, we've learned, we've adapted, we've evolved, and we've listened to our partners. And listening to your priorities, working in partnership with you, it has led us here to today, um, to the last day of our Alliances for Equity Forum, which has far succeeded any expectations we could have ever had. Um, as we conclude this event, I want to remind you this really is just the beginning and the RNPN is transforming. Um, we need to focus on some of the biggest resilience challenges our organizations and our stakeholders are facing. And that's starting with equity. To do that, to make an impact, it will require this network to take a monumental step forward. Uh, that is moving beyond discussions and to catalyzing actions that result in measurable change. And action takes effort. It will take understanding, awareness, honesty, and an unwavering commitment to partnership. Um, it can and, and should push us out of our comfort zones. It's going to require compassion, camaraderie, and a desire to genuinely understand the feelings and the challenges of others. Um, everyone who has joined us for this event clearly has proven that we are committed to action and doing so inclusively. So regarding the next steps for the RNPN, our team is consolidating your questions, comments, and feedback over the course of the series. Uh, we'll be working alongside NOAA and with our speaker organizations to co-develop a post-event summary resource. That means we also want to hear from you. What were your takeaways? What initiatives does your organization have ongoing? What are your needs? What are your challenges? The actions of the RNPN are driven by priorities identified and communicated by you, our partner organizations. The more we hear from you, the more value this network can provide. And so um, inspired by Dion Ferris, I'm going to finish uh, just with some data. So the forum series had 33 speakers representing 28 different organizations over the four days um, and 10 hours. So it's 10 hours. Just before we started today, we had 1,301 registrants representing more than 500 organizations. Nearly 2,200 attendees combined ac uh, attended across all four days of the forum. There is one statistic that I hope we can highlight during the next annual forum, and that is the number of partnerships and connections that were formed coming out of this event. Um, it truly has been an amazing four sessions, and we are looking forward to continuing to collaborate with you as we move forward. Um, to watch the recordings of all four sessions, please visit the Alliances for Equity event page. Uh, we'll place the URL in the chat in just a moment. Um, to learn more about the Resilient Nation Partnership Network, um, you know, you can email us at fema-resilientnation at fema.dhs.gov, or you can visit our website on fema.gov. Uh, once again, uh, thank you all so very much for your participation, your attendance, and your commitment. And we look forward to seeing you and collaborating with you at our next um, RNPN event. Thank you.